Hello everyone. In our series of podcasts that review the major risk categories for India in 2021, this one is on geopolitical risk. Our two analysts from Midcat's predictive risk intelligence team who will be pre- presenting this today are Harman Arora and Meghna Jaswal. Harman has a master's in international studies from Christ University. She has a bachelor's degree in economics from Delhi University. She is based out of Delhi and has previously worked and interned with organizations like Center for Policy Research uh, and Nehru Memorial Museum. Meghna has a master's in international studies from Christ University. She has a bachelor's degree in BA triple majors, including English, political science, and history. She is based out of Jammu and has previously worked and interned with organizations like UN International Organization for Migration and Global Counterterrorism Council. Before proceeding further, I request you all to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Over to you, Harman. Hello, everyone. Nina and I are here today to discuss the geopolitical risks that India has faced in the recent past, and we will further analyze the upcoming geopolitical risks in 2021. We will be covering the much talked about India-China border conflict. the present situation in jammu and kashmir insurgencies in northeast india myanmar coup cross border terrorism and india's relations with bangladesh and nepal in this podcast starting with the most talked about issue of 2020 india china border conflict the trajectory of india china crisis began at pangong so lake on 5th may 2020 Since the tensions along the borders were at a fever pitch with military buildups on both sides, a meeting at the core commander level, 6th June, began a cautious disengagement process. However, on 15 June 2020, a disagreement and a subsequent clash took place between India and Chinese petrol parties at Petrol Point 14 in the Galwan Valley. While no fire firearms were used, the clash witnessed the use of hand-to-hand combat, stones, sticks, etc. In the month of August, skirmishes expanded to southern shore of Pangong So after the Chinese troops were reported to have intruded the Ladakhi village of Chushul. The Indian Army pushed back this attempt and launched an operation to secure certain strategic peaks in the Kailash Range, which were unoccupied by either side earlier. This was an important uh, development in the whole conflict, as while the earlier standoffs had been on the north banks, northern banks of the river, this was the first time during the crisis that the southern bank publicly became an area of dispute. These positions allowed India to not only dominate Spangur Gap, which is a two-kilometer-wide valley that can be used to launch an offensive, as China had done in 1962. They also allow India a direct view of China's Moldo garrison. However, the Chinese foreign minister spokesman denied any intrusion by PLA into Indian territory and accused Indian military military of provocation and violating China's territorial sovereignty. The scuffle went on for several months, and the tale of deteriorating relations continued in 2021 when Chinese and Indian troops clashed again in the Nakula in North Sikkim in January 2021, another disputed border area with injuries reported on both sides. So, in a major uh, breakthrough in talks to resolve the nine-month military standoff along the LAC in Ladakh, India and China, in the early months of 2021, decided to finally reach an agreement on disengagement at Pangong Lake, which has been at the heart of the recent LAC tensions. Further disengagement is yet to yet to be discussed for the other friction points. All. So the disengagement is partial at the moment. It is significant pros- progress in India-China border relations. As far as the bilateral relations are concerned, India convened, conveyed a message underlining that without full disengagement along the LAC and then de-escalation, restoring normalcy in the relationship would not be possible. If the border issue gets completely de-escalated, The bilateral relationship is expected to find a new equilibrium in 2021 as a result of a tremendous change in the relations since May 2020 and the increased distrust. While going uh, ahead with the disengagement at the LAC, India is also strengthening her quad relations in the region. The quad countries can in turn fill in capability gaps that India has with China and provide solutions and alternatives in the region. With India's atmanirbhar Uh, Bharat, the economic exchanges might also be rebalanced in the coming time. India would be trying to manufacture goods domestically rather than getting them imported. 
India in the recent border clashes has also given a message to China through her military actions and disengagement talks that no decisions regarding the LAC can be taken taken unilaterally. Therefore, undoubtedly, this this engagement has come as a relief to both the nations. It does not guarantee the restoration of status quo of the bilateral relations that prevailed before 2020, as dynamics in the South Asian region are also changing at fast pace. Some of the possible impacts on Indian industries as a result of this belligerence by China could be: firstly, supply chains of many companies would be affected, especially those in pharmaceutical industries where maximum APIs are imported from China. Secondly, there would be an effect on the telecommunications industry as a result of partial bans on Chinese telecom equipment. Then China may decide to restrict the supply of rare earth elements to India, which may affect many. Technology industries, Chinese nationals of companies that operate in India may face some heightened risks in the case the tensions are escalated again. And lastly, normal business relations and travel between the two countries may be affected. Now, my colleague will talk about the current situation in Jammu and Kashmir. Moving on, many new developments have been witnessed in the Union territory of JNK. Firstly, we shall begin with a brief discussion on the removal of special status of JNK, followed by the subsequent effects of this change. Article three seventy of the Indian Constitution was a temporary provision which granted special autonomous status to Jammu and Kashmir. The special status to the UT of Jammu and Kashmir was revoked on fifth August two thousand and nineteen, and thus Article three seventy and thirty five A were abrogated. JNK was divided into two union territories, that is Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. International reaction was varied as most countries agreed that the changes in JNK were India's internal matter and differences should be resolved through dialogue between India and Pakistan. Furthermore, the District Development Council polls were the first major elections held in the UT of JNK after the Modi government last year scrapped the erstwhile state's semi-autonomous status and divided it into two separate UTs, JNK and Ladakh. However, soon after the election results were declared, Omar Abdullah, supported by other several members of official uh, opposition parties, accused the JNK administration of attempting to change the DDC election results and also coerce independent candidates to join parties other than the PAGD. Moving on, the impact of this would be seen as there were significant developments in the UT of JNK. According to the Union Ministry of Home Affairs report, terror-related activities have been reduced by around 36% in the valley after the abrogation of Article 370. There has also been a 40% decrease in the involvement of local youth in terrorist organizations. Work on the Tapur Kandi electricity and irrigation project, which had been delayed for five decades, has also started. Over 10,000 vacancies at all levels have been identified for recruitment in various departments. The UT administration has also decided to provide reservation to Pahari-speaking people and economically weaker sections. More than three lakh Jammu and Kashmir government employees are now getting benefits under the Seventh Central Pay Commission. However, JNK's economy, horticulture, and tourism has suffered due to the lockdown imposed when the special status was revoked. Apart from these positive developments in terms of infrastructure, economy, and administration, as we discussed before, the DDC elections marked the opening of democratic space at local level in JNK. However, as per the latest developments seen in the UT, the elected members are quite disappointed with the powers granted to them and have been protesting to achieve a better status and honorarium. Another recent development in the UT of JNK are the holding centers that are to be set up with the aim of deporting illegal immigrants. Who have been staying in Jammu for the last several years? An exercise in this regard has already started by initiating the verification process of Rohingyas living in Jammu and Kashmir. The Rohingyas staying in the UT of JNK on March six were sent back to these holding centers. There have been objections on the deportation of the Rohingyas back to Myanmar to the threat of the military in the country. In response to this, on eleventh March, an interim plea was filed. In a pending PIL seeking immediate release of detained Rohingya refugees in Jammu and restrain the state, uh, center from deporting them, the Supreme Court would hear a fresh plea seeking immediate release of detained Rohingyas in Jammu on March 20. No further developments on the matter have been observed as of now. Adding on to this, it is also pertinent to understand the border tensions between India and Pakistan and the changing nature of these tensions and the diplomatic effort taken to resolve them. Uh, moving on, uh, speaking about the cross-border terrorism and Indo-Pak ceasefire agreement, uh, 
Since the past two years, there have been high rising tensions between the two countries due to various ceasefire violations and border skirmishes. The Pulmama attack was a major issue and in retaliation, India launched the Balakot strikes. Tensions were later resolved as India and Pakistan were seen ending hostilities, especially after PM Modi won elections for the second time. Tensions on the border, however, again increased uh, after August 5th, 2019, when special status of JNK was revoked. Tensions increased along the border area of Tangdhar, Uri, Punch, Mendhar, Rajauri, Naushera, Sundarbani, Araspura, and Kathua district on the international border. While Pakistan tried to internationalize the situation, India maintained the stand that Kashmir is a demo, uh, domestic issue and hence it is India's internal matter. However, abrogation of Article 370 and consequent lockdown and cutoff of internet service led to at least 30% drop in the number of terrorist attacks targeting civilians and security forces, while bomb diffusions and raids on terrorist hideouts doubled in 2020. Subsequently, arrest of terrorists also increased by a factor of two. Alongside these improving indicators, there has been a tremendous deterioration in the situation on the India-Pakistan line of control. As per the reported incidents in the year following the effective abrogation of Article 370, Pakistan initiated ceasefire violations at least on 167 occasions. Moving on, seeing the impact of this change in the year 2021, India and Pakistan armies agreed to a ceasefire along the line of control from midnight 24-25 February. The Director Generals of Military Operations of the two countries held discussions over the hotline and agreed to observe ceasefire in the interest of achieving mutually beneficial and sustainable peace along the border. Both sides also repeated that existing mechanisms of hotline contact and border flag meetings will be utilized to resolve any unforeseeable situation or misunderstanding in future. However, um, thinking on these lines, this outreach by Pakistan could be possibly because Pakistan is still in the gray area of the Financial Action Task Force for Funding Terrorism. Also, with NATO and American forces possibly pulling out of Afghanistan, Pakistan does not want to continue tension on both borders. And lastly, Pakistan's economic situation is such that it would currently want to focus more on its economic development. Moving on, Harman will shed some light on the status of insurgencies in Northeast India. Uh, although insurgency was on decline in Northeast in 2020-21, Assam and Nagaland remain areas of concern for the Indian authorities. Talking about Nagaland, the Naga peace process appeared to have again hit a roadblock in 2020 after decades of negotiations. Although the recent demands of National Socialist Council of Nagalim, NSCNIM, the most influential Naga outfit group, had toned down from complete sovereignty to greater autonomous region within the Indian constitutional framework, uh, with due regard to the uniqueness of Naga history and traditions, negotiations with the group had remained complicated as Nagas are demanding the integration of their ancestral homelands, which include territories in Assam, Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh. This did not go down well with the three other states and as a, as a result, all of them refused to cede territory to the Nagas. Manipur even protested in a petition that any compromise with Manipur's ter territorial integrity would not be tolerated. The other two states made it clear that they would not compromise with their territorial integrity as well. A letter written by the governor R. N. Ravi is also the center's interlocutor for the ongoing uh, Naga peace talks to the CM of Nagaland also resulted into an immediate stalemate. In his letter, the governor expressed his anguish over the culture of extortion and the collapse of general law and order situation in Nagaland, where organized armed uh, gangs run their own parallel tax collection regimes, hitting at the armed group, referring to its major aims to acquire formal recognition of this formal practice through negotiations. Furthermore, he also ruled out the possibility of separate flag and constitution for the community, which was almost a non-negotiable demand by the armed group. After many rounds of talks and differences over a lot of issues, the governor recently announced that the political negotiations are concluded and there is now a need for efforts to build on the substantial gains made so far and to move swift swiftly for the final solution. However, the armed group also very recently, after the uh, governor's uh, statement, has claimed that this 
his assertion was reckless and talks are back on the table the naga group said it would not sign any agreement that is short of mutual standards agreed upon but will this final solution be ever reached given the uh, distrust and the diverging demands though as per reports nagaland governor rn ravi was all set to hold an emergency meeting with a delegation of the armed group led, led by their senior leader in new delhi on 9th march to reach at a final solution we do not think that naga peace accord would be signed once and for all any time soon, soon owing to the major distrust issues between the center and the armed group the age old issues pertaining to the agreement bold statements with serious accusations against each other made by both the parties involved in the peace talks in the recent times and reaching to a single final agreement that pleases all naga factions are some of the reasons behind the failed attempts at peace in the past and perhaps in the future this peace process does not require more rounds of talks because that's all the progress that has been made since 1997 it seems but a more cooperative approach rational thinking and a strong will to bring in peace in the disturbed present coming to assam the decision to extend afspa by the state government in august 2020 for 6 months wasn't welcomed by people of the state the increase in insurgent attacks on security forces in the northeast region and recovery of illegal arms and ammunition from different areas of assam led to the state being labeled as a disturbed area however 2021 saw atmosphere of the region changing to a peaceful one in a recent surrender 1040 militants of five militant groups of karabi anglong district laid down arms at an event in guwahati in the presence of chief minister ahead of the state's assembly elections This development came a year after a peace and development agreement was signed between the center and multiple bodo militant outfits bringing an end to a violent movement for a separate bodo land. And what's the most important development to note is that among the surrendered militants is Songvijit Kathar a primary accused in militant multiple cases of militancy and ethnic violence in the state. He was in fact the most wanted man in the state of Assam. Now what does this surrender mean for the state and assembly elections the surrender is being seen as a win win situation uh, for the state in terms of both maintaining peace in the disturbed region and electorally it kind of further bolstered the terrorism free assam image of the current bjp led government and increased their chances of winning the upcoming state elections in future we are predicting decrease in the insurgency cases in assam and the state can finally focus on development rather peacefully The next major topic of discussion in the sec- is the security situation in Myanmar as witnessed after the military coup and also the effects this coup has on Myanmar as well as understanding India's position of this situation my colleague will tell you more about it The military coup of 1st February 2021 in Myanmar has resulted in political turmoil in the nation The coup came after weeks of rising tensions between the military and the civilian government over allegations of fraud in the recent November 2020 elections. On February 1st, 2021, the military detained the de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi along with Myanmar's president and other senior members of National League for Democracy party in the capital Naypyidaw. After seizing control, the military took certain major steps. The first step taken was imposing one year long state of emergency in the country. Secondly, they handed over the power of Myanmar governance to the military chief Min Aung Liang. The impact of this scene was that the military firstly maintains that the takeover is legitimate under the 2008 constitution that was drafted under the military rule and ensures that the army maintains ultimate control over the country and has also put restrictions in terms of curfew, blockage of internet and revisions of telecommunication policy following their takeover. The United Nations, the United States, and major other governments have urged the military to return power to the elected government and release Suu Kyi and other detainees. People are demonstrating across more than three hundred cities and towns. A civil disobedience movement has come up in the country, which has been rapidly spreading and has gained momentum. Most banks and business operations are closed due to widespread public condemnation following. the uh, people who are supporting the junta thereby people are being held accountable the country's economy is already under pressure and fragile due to the pandemic on top of which international sanctions and threats to the rule of law make the situation even more precarious in totality business operations are impacted due to the targeted sanctions on the tatmadaw leadership by us uk and canada 
most banks are closed government offices are also empty and the country's fuel supply is running on a shortage universities schools hospitals remain closed as well as factories as everybody is involved in the civil disobedience movement in terms of travel intra city travel is not banned however intra state travel has been restricted and all passenger flights have been grounded the cities are barricaded with barbed wires concrete roadblocks and military units have begun to appear outside government buildings such as city halls with armored tanks and soldiers deployed in yangon also in the wake of the coup some burmese are now changing their views of their muslim uh, countrymen that is that are the rohingyas the tatmadaw has become the common enemy now the rohingyas have been showing their support towards other countrymen through the three finger salute which has been popularized however their future in the country still remains uncertain the india stand on military coup is another important topic which needs to be discussed first of all myanmar is too important to new delhi to ignore as it sits at the intersection of india's neighborhood first and act east policy being the land bridge to connect south asia and southeast asia and thus it demands a special place in india's diplomacy in the broader region of indo pacific sitwe in the rakhine province is also at stake for india due to the seaport built by india in the province the location of the port will play a central role in connecting the northeast region to the sea and china's string of pearl policy are the reason why china is not india is not taking a clear stand against uh, the military or imposing sanctions as per the data given by the indian embassy in yangon there are about 100 indian companies in myanmar with investments over 1.2 billion us dollars thus with regards to the indian business community in myanmar they are still on the wait and watch mode another issue likely to impact india would be the refugee crisis triggered due to the security situation in myanmar ministry of home affairs has already issued an issued an advisory dated 25th february to chief secretaries of mizoram nagaland manipur and arunachal pradesh and also the border guarding forces along the imb to stay alert and take appropriate action in order to prevent a possible influx into indian territory around 100 people primarily myanmar police officers and their families have fled to india since the protest began the indian government is likely to maintain its previous stand with regard to myanmar that is to readopt its policy of the 1990s of extending moral support for democracy while dealing respectfully with the myanmar military whether this policy would be beneficial following the sanctions which could be imposed by us and other nations is yet to be determined india still believes that imposing sanctions is in the right way of dealing with the crisis the next topic of discussion in this podcast would be the interstate water conflicts which would be discussed by my colleague harman interstate conflicts in india have been primarily related to issues in sharing of water resources between states talking about the issue between telangana and andhra pradesh In 2020 the Godavari and Krishna water sharing dispute between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana gained prominence in order to bring a resolution to the dispute Krishna river management board along with an apex council was appointed by the central government while both states are required to obtain approval from the apex council prior to the beginning pro- prior to beginning projects on Godavari and Krishna rivers as per the reorganization act Telangana government had claimed several Andhra river projects as illegal alleging violations and threatened to construct a barrage on the Krishna river in Andhra Pradesh and went ahead with the project proposal the Andhra government had also accused Telangana of similar projects without prior approval talking about Karnataka and Tamil Nadu another prominent river water sharing dispute is the Kaveri issue it had been dormant in the past year but it is a contentious issue that is likely to keep cropping up regularly The dispute stems from the Kaveri River which originates in Karnataka and flows through Tamil Nadu. As such, several districts in both states are dependent on the river for irrigation, especially Bangalore that gets most of its water supply from this river. The 2018 verdict of the Apex Court increased Karnataka's share of the Kaveri water than what was awarded in the Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal in 2007. Recently, Tamil Nadu announced a river interlinking project with the aim of using excess kaveri flow creating more complications for the interstate dispute over water sharing it was then reported that karnataka might think of a similar scheme and form a committee to drop a master plan in order to counter counter tamil nadu's claim over surplus water what is the future of this dispute 
the kaveri water sh- uh, sharing issue has resurfaced because the kaveri tribunal award issued in 2007 and the supreme court's 2018 verdict on the interstate road did not cover the issue of surplus water and this is one of the reasons for the current situation to make things better in the future for both the states the states have to seek clarification from the court on the same therefore until the time both or either of the states take matter to the court this water sharing dispute is here to stay further into the podcast we shall discuss india's relation with its neighboring countries talking of the india bangladesh relations in the past we have seen that there have been certain issues in the bilateral relations between the two countries firstly regarding the rohingya refugees bangladesh perception has been that india has not provided enough support thereafter the citizenship amendment act and national registry of citizens seem to have impacted sentiments in bangladesh even though it is officially termed as an internal issue of india the recent states of affairs between the two nations were highlighted during the visit by the external affairs minister s jay shankar on 4th march 2021 jay shankar termed tista water sharing as a big issue the river dispute is an important point of bilateral talks between india and bangladesh India and Bangladesh had also signed an agreement in 2011 to share surface water at Faraka barrage near the mutual border. Though the water sharing issue was once again discussed during PM Modi's visit to Dhaka in June 2015, it still remains unresolved. India's COVID-19 assistance to Bangladesh was also highlighted in the discussion as India provided Bangladesh with the highest numbers of vaccine than any other country. Moving on, in future what we would see is that modi's visit to bangladesh his first trip after covid-19 lockdown comes as a part of government's neighborhood first policy focusing on resolving old disputes and establishing closer ties with the nation as well as countering china's dominance in the region india is focusing on enhancing infrastructure connectivity and plans to take dhaka into its strategic embrace under the umbrella of indo pacific cooperation The recently inaugurated Maitri Setu 1.9 km bridge built over Feni River will connect Tripura with Bangladesh. On the Indian side, it will connect with an integrated check post on the land border between Sabroom in India and Ramgar in Bangladesh. Apart from Maitri Setu, India and Bangladesh are involved in a number of other initiatives which encompass water and shipping, railways, boats and airlines aimed at asserting land especially at a time when china has made strategic inroads into india's immediate and distant neighborhood moving on harman would now discuss the india nepal land and border issue uh, relations between india and nepal have been strong and deep rooted however there have been recent sh- shifts in these relations in the aftermath of abrogation of article 370 and 35a in jammu and kashmir India's realigned map showing Kala Pani on Lipu Lake in Indi- inside Indian territory led to a political opposition from Nepal as the area is regarded as Nepali by its territory subsequently the issue came to the forefront again in May 2020 when India inaugurated an 80 km road passing through Lipu Lake part of the territory that Nepal consider as its own This led to a diplomatic tussle and a cartographic debate when the government of Nepal released a new political map of Nepal including the locations in India that were claimed by it. Moreover, Nepal had also launched a new national emblem with a new map and the Indian sentiment Nepal have existence existed an official economic embargo along the India Nepal border in 2015 and aggravated with the events such as the map incident. now what uh, has what does this uh, do to the regional dynamics china nepal's other major neighbor had strategically utilized the rising anti india sentiment to portray themselves as a viable alternative opening up of port facilities and providing access to trans himalayan railway reduced nepal's dependency on india nepal also has joined china's bri india remains a key player in nepal despite strains in bilateral relations 
Furthermore, K.P. Sharma Oli decided to dissolve the parliament in December 2020, and the Supreme Court termed the move as unconstitutional, thereby rendering Oli with no power and support in the country. So now, anti-India sentiments may not be as heightened in the country owing to the changing political scenario domestically. The bilateral exchanges between the two nations had had stalled due to the bitter uh, boundary dispute, were reset in, reset in the later part of 2020 with a series of high-level visits at Indi as India emphasized that it sees itself as a Himalayan nation's foremost friend and development partner. Thank you.